ಧ್ವನಿರ್ವರ್ಣಾಪದಂ ವಾಕ್ಯಮಿತ್ಯಾಸ್ವದುಷ್ಟಯ ಯೂಷ್ಮೇ ವಾಗ್ದೇವಿ ತಾಮೂಪಸ್ಮಹೆ The Electronic Media Production and Research Center EMPRC of Madhya Pradesh Bhuj Open University presents an audio program of English literature. This audio program will be useful to the student of BA first year. This audio program is based on the second unit of first paper titled Literature in English from 1550 to 1750 AD. The title of audio program is John Milton the poet and his poems to deliver the lecture on this topic we have invited our subject expert dr shubhra tripathi sound edited and presented by amar bahadur yadav let's listen to the audio program john milton the poet and his poems The focus of today's lecture is John Milton, the poet and his poems. This lecture is meant for students of BA first year English literature and this is from the second unit of poetry of the first paper entitled Literature in English from 1550 to 1750. The objectives of this lecture are that by the time the session is over you will be able to state about the life and works of john milton identify the three phases of his creativity trace the evolution of his poetic talents identify the features of his poetry and distinguish his sonnets from those of other poets friends before we begin talking about milton's works it is very important that we talk about his life as you know any writer is shaped by his education his family background and the society in which he lives and at the same time he also influences the society in which he lives that is his works are shaped and he shapes the society too and this is more particularly in the case of john milton because he was one single influence which dominated the literary scene of the 17th century so much so that the literature of his times in literary history is known as the age of milton milton was born on 9th december 1608 in london his father john milton senior was a puritan by sympathies and he also had love for art and literature milton died on 8th November 1674. His father was a well-to-do person and he encouraged his son to have education and at the same time be a scholar that he wanted to. He was educated at St. Paul's School and Christ Church College, Cambridge. These were two prestigious educational institutions of that time. While Milton was at Cambridge, he had his first phase of creativity. This is the college period at Cambridge till 1632. As a young man, he wrote several poems and these poems were experimental poems in English and Latin. Now friends, from this fact you can make out that Milton not only knew and studied English but also Latin which was the language of education at that time. And the poems which he wrote during this phase were 
on the death of a fair infant this was in 1629 and on the morning of Christ's nativity again written in 1629 are sufficient to put him in the category of great poets so much so that Hudson and other poet other writers have remarked that they are although experimental works but they are sufficient to put him declare him as a good and great poet after this milton had a second phase of creativity when he left cambridge and came to live with his father hudson says even if paradise lost had never been written they would have sufficed to put their author high among the greater gods of english song the poems that he wrote in the second phase of creativity while he lived at horton with his father were written between 1632 and 1637 this is after he left cambridge and by this time he had decided that he would be a poet he could not join the clergy which was one of the respectable professions for educated people at that time this is a very important fact because milton was a puritan by temperament and his father also had puritan sympathies perhaps this was the reason why he could not join the clergy and therefore as he had already decided he devoted himself to poetry completely during this phase he was a voracious reader since childhood and during this phase he became a great scholar because he devoted his time to studies and he would uh, usually study till late at night which was again going to influence his life in a big way later on during this phase Milton wrote two poems L'Allegro and Il Penseroso these two poems L'Allegro and Il Penseroso represent two moods of human uh, nature one is joyous and happy the other is sad and these are the two facets of human personality too this was in 1632 then he wrote a mask Camus this was in 1634 and Lycidas a pastoral elegy in 1637 all these poems and uh, poetic works they put him in the category of great poets and they are sufficient to eclipse other poets of his times and that is the reason why this age is called the age of milton of course later on he wrote other works like paradise lost which are again very great but by this time milton had achieved a lot the significance of these works is although they are exquisite works of literature they are very beautiful pieces very good technically and as far as music is concerned they are exquisite but they also show that a profound change was happening in milton's mind now why do we say this we say this because milton in his works shows that he experiments uh, with new thoughts which are there with him due to his training his sympathies his tendencies his feelings and emotions but at the same time he blends them with the tradition of poetry which he had studied all through the classical masters that he had studied during this phase after studying and living with his father for some time he resolved to complete his studies by travel you might be surprised why did he think so you must bear in mind that those days latin was considered to be the language of educated people so milton decided that if he has a rich experience of the continental life he would be able to write better poems all these facts they show that he was a very conscious artist a very conscious poet so he went on a continental tour in 1638 he visited france italy and other places and while on his tour he received news of charles first invasion of scotland now this shocked the puritan sympathies as i told you earlier milton had sympathy for the puritans now i have been using this term puritan uh, what does puritan uh, or this expression mean in the unit 7 you will study the literary history and in this you will study about puritans but it would be pertinent to ponder over here and think and understand what this term means as you know that this was a time when there was a radical reaction 
among people of England against the Roman Catholic Church and these people were against the corruption that was taking place in the church and they opposed the rituals and the traditions which the church was following. So it does not mean that they were opposing faith or God. They were simply against the practices of the church. They were simpler people. They in a way wanted to get rid of certain influences or the practices that the church was practicing at the time. So Milton, they were quite austere and they were deeply believed in God. So this kind of sensibility which Milton had and which also his father had, that was shaken when he heard of the news of Charles I's invasion. And Milton once said, I thought it base to be travelling for my amusement abroad while my fellow citizens were fighting for liberty at home. Now this also shows the fact that he is thinking about liberty. It was a very modern feeling at that time to think about liberty, which was later uh, very prominent at the time of French Revolution. So Milton thought about his fellow countrymen and he decided to return back. So he returned to England and since he was thinking about the political situation of the time, you might think that he would have joined politics on his return. But this did not happen. He started teaching in a school. So you see there are two things which are happening to this poet. He is a great scholar. He is associated with education and scholarship. At the same time being educated, he is thinking about the society, his country and what is happening around him. During this time, he also got married to Mary Powell in 1643 at the age of 33. Unfortunately, this union was not a very happy one, as they were mutually incompatible. Mary was a royalist by temperament and background, and Milton was against royalty. Now, Milton, 1640 onwards, became an active supporter of the Puritans. And how did he become an active supporter? He became a pamphleteer. He started writing pamphlets and he was a very good author. He could write very well. You are going to study Milton as a poet, but as a prose writer also, he was very effective and his pamphlets were very effective. On the establishment of Commonwealth, he was appointed Latin Secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And one of the reasons was that he was very eloquent about social and political issues in his pamphlets. This was the third phase of his creativity. Let us recapitulate. The first phase was when he was in college, he was at Cambridge, he was writing immature poems. Some of them were very good ones and very mature. The second phase was when he left Cambridge, came to live with his father and went on a continental tour. This was the second phase and now we come to the third phase when he was the Latin secretary and he was basically writing prose works. His first prose work was written uh, in 1642 which was entitled A Tract on Divorce. Obviously, as we mentioned earlier, since his marriage was not a very happy one, divorce for him was very important. Then there was a tractate on education and another one on entitled Areopagitica. The one on education obviously shows that he was concerned about education in the society and in his times. And Areopagitica is a work which talks about freedom of speech, freedom of expression. This is again a very modern idea and it shows that Milton was far ahead of his times. Then in 1645, three years after the first tract on divorce, came two tracts on divorce. So this issue of divorce, which was not very popular then, which was not sanctioned then, uh, was very dear to Milton because he was personally going through bad phase in his married life. Then in 1649, he wrote another article entitled Tenure of Kings and Magistrates. Now all these show that he was very deeply involved in the society of his times with the political upheaval that was taking place in England and he was basically as Latin secretary writing prose. But this was the third phase of creativity in which he wrote his sonnets also, one of which is prescribed for you. And his sonnets were in Italian 
and English both. The sonnets which he wrote, the earlier sonnets were addressed to one of uh, his uh, fellow classmates, a girl called Emily or Emilia. And this shows that he was following the tradition of Petrarch and other sonneteers before him of addressing love sonnets to his beloved. But his later sonnets, the ones in English and the one prescribed for you, will show that he not only followed tradition, but he transcended that and became a very special kind of sonneteer. By this time, by the year 1653, his eyesight was ruined completely due to overwork and stress. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the first phase of his creativity, I said that this is a very important fact that he was a great scholar and he studied and read a lot. Due to this strain and overwork, he lost his eyesight and he also wrote a sonnet on losing his sight, which is entitled On His Blindness. At this time, he married Catherine Woodcock, but unfortunately, she died within 15 months. So, this union was again a not a very happy one. During this time, in the year 1660, monarchy was restored and Milton, who was against monarchy, who was a supporter of Puritanism, was arrested, fined and then later released. And he was very fortunate to have been released because uh, people were much against him, those who were royalists and his books were publicly burnt by hangmen. So, it is like, you know, hanging the person, it's symbolic of that. But he was fortunately saved by Marvel, who was a poet, and some royalists. And it is said that these royalists, it, though did not like his pamphlets, the kind of propaganda that he was doing, but they liked his poems. So, Milton, the poet, was saved from the wrath of the royalists. By this time, he had become poor, he was lonely, and he became blind, totally blind. Some comfort came from his third wife, Elizabeth Minchel. At this time, he felt bitterly for the failure of the Puritan cause. Obviously, he had devoted a lot of time to this cause and uh, being blind, he felt handicapped and this was a very terrible time for him. But he did not get depressed completely and this is the fourth phase of his creativity which produced one of his best works called Paradise Lost. In this phase, he returned to poetry which he had left while he was writing prose uh, tracts. The epic Paradise Lost was written in 1667. And in this epic, very famous English epic, he begins by saying that he is going to justify the ways of God to men. He talks about man's first disobedience. He is talking about Adam and Eve and how they are thrown out of the Garden of Eden. But thrown out of paradise, so paradise is lost to them. But he also says that he is going to justify the ways of God to men. So see, he was a Puritan, he opposed the church, but he did not lose faith in God at all and he wanted to justify the ways of God to men. At this time, he soon regained uh, his, uh, from his uh, depressing mood and he wrote Paradise Regained and Samson Ignustus. This was in 1671. So, 1667 to 1671, a span of almost 4-5 years, he produced some of the greatest poetries in English literature. Let us now, now talk about the qualities of his poetry. His poetry shows a great moral and religious influence of Puritanism. He is constantly talking about divine, uh, he is constantly talking about God and as you will see in the sonnet that we are going to analyze and study in the second part, he is again concerned with his faith. His faith is never shaken in his religion in God. In another sonnet that he had written on his blindness, which is entitled On His Blindness, he says, When I consider how my light is spent in er, half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide lodged with useless. He is talking about his talent of poetry and he says, in the end, they also serve who stand and wait. Those people for whom the talent has become useless, 
he is talking about his blindness he says i am handicapped i am not able to use my talent any more but he says that even if i wait upon god i am also serving god so you see his poems are very religious and they also serve as a moral for the younger generation today then his poems they show a generous culture of renasa what was renasa renasa was an age when people turned towards classical masters not only for guidance but also for comfort and solace they emulated the classical masters and they wanted to achieve that high standard which classical master had attained this happened not only in literature but other arts like painting music etc so milton's poetry shows a generous influence a good measure of this uh, renasa influence in his poetry now you would say that this is contradictory he is a puritan and he also talks of renasa this is a paradox but uh, because renasa talked about beauty it talked about other things the good things in life and puritans did not attach so much importance to the, these things so there is there is a blend of these two elements in milton's poetry his early works show a marked tendency towards renasa art can you think of a reason why this happened remember in his early works when he was writing early poetry he was studying the classical masters so obviously uh, he had a kind of tendency towards copying their art but this is again not mere copying the classical masters he had creativity of his own otherwise his poems could not have stood the test of time but gradually as we move towards his other works we find that the puritan tendency the puritan sympathy or the puritan emotion predominates his works so he moves from renasa towards puritanism in his works we find a union of intellectual and creative power now what does this mean he had creative power because he had been studying the classical masters but he was being a great scholar he had thought much about what was happening around him and so the intellectual content of his works is no less the intellectual vitality is a driving force in his works so much so that miltonic quality when we talk about poetry we talk about milton we specify that his works had a quality which is termed by critics as miltonic and this quality was by other traditional critics it was synonymous uh, with sublimity of his poems that means that his poems not only talk of the sublime but they also raise the ordinary emotion of ordinary human beings to a sublime standard they make the ordinary sublime and this is the quality of his poem it is not that he is merely talking about his subject matter is sublime he also his craft his art his creativity is also sublime it matches with the mood of his poems he was a consummate literary artist and he is the first poet to use blank verse for non dramatic compositions who was using blank verse before milton for dramatic compositions shakespeare was doing that and he perfected the, the blank verse to suit his plays but milton has the credit of using it for the non dramatic purposes now for you students uh, you have a sonnet of milton which is prescribed and in fact two of the earlier classes we had talked about sonnets first we talked about sonnets in the in general how it uh, originated how the petrarchan model came to england and then we talked about the sonnets of shakespeare if you have attended those sessions it would be worthwhile to recall what we discussed there but in case you have missed we just recapitulate that sonnet was a poem of 14 lines and it was used by milton and other poets before him it came from italy to england and there was a pattern which had been decided and used by poets so the form had already been perfected there was a tradition of sonnet writing before milton started exploiting this form but milton's sonnets are quite unique they are different from those there are 24 sonnets in all which milton has written six of these which he wrote around 1629 are in italian 
सो दिस इज वन डिफरेंस बिटवीन हिम एंड अदर इंग्लिश पोएट्स अपरेंटली दीज इटालियन सोनेट्स आर रिटन फॉर अ गर्ल इटालियन गर्ल एमिलिया एंड दे वर रिटन वेन मिल्टन वॉज स्टडिंग इटालियन लैंग्वेज ऑब्वियसली दिस फॉर्म ओरिजिनेटेड फ्रॉम इटली एंड ही वॉज स्टडिंग द लैंग्वेज एंड दे फॉर यू कैन पुट टू एंड टू टूगेदर दैट दैट इज हाउ ही वॉज फॉलोइंग द क्लासिकल मास्टर्स एंड ही रोट सोनेट्स इन इटालियन बट वेन ही रोट सोनेट्स इन इंग्लिश these are occasional sonnets they are written for certain occasions that means he is not following the tradition of earlier sonneteers of writing sonnets either for their beloveds or writing them in praise of their patrons or addressing them and putting them in a sequence so whenever poets before him wrote sonnets they put them in a sequence and they could be grouped together but not so in the case of milton these sonnets were published in a volume which was entitled poems etc upon several occasions the title itself shows that he is writing sonnets for particular occasions and this volume was published in 1673 talking about his sonnets wordsworth said that this became a trumpet in his hands they are grave moralizing personal experiences and they talk of other human affairs they are autobiographical in nature especially the sonnet that i mentioned on his blindness it talks about how he became blind how he became depressed it begins when i consider how my light is spent how i became blind when i think about it and what thoughts cross his mind and how he uh, overcomes those Uh, this is somewhat similar to the sonnet that we are going to deal with in the second part of the session and this sonnet is on his 23rd birthday that it begins how soon hath time the subtle thief of youth we are going to talk about this in detail in the second part this is again a very autobiographical sonnet so his sonnets they dispensed general moral advice they talked about restoring human beings faith in god they also talk about specific political advice they talk about cromwell a chief of men who threw a cloud this is again a very specific sonnet let us revise what we have talked about so far we talked about john milton's place in english literature the major events in his life major poetic and prose works evolution of milton as a poet qualities of his poetry and themes of his sonnets in this way we have talked about the poet in general in the next session we'll talk about his sonnet in particular you are just listening an audio program john milton the poet and his poems subject expert and speaker was dr shubhra tripathi announcer was prem sharan khemaria This audio program was edited and presented by Amar Bahadur Yadav. This program was produced by the Electronic Media Production and Research Center EMP RC of Madhya Pradesh Bhoj Open University in association with NITTTR Bhopal.